Traditional Catholics are united in their opposition to the changes made to the Church after the Second Vatican Council, but even though there is agreement that Vatican II must be opposed, there is division over exactly what form that opposition should take. With many of those who call themselves traditional, the opposition to Vatican II seems to be rooted in just a preference for traditional liturgy, and therefore they are content to find a Latin Mass side chapel within the modernist church and operate as though their church was not teaching a different faith. There are still others who claim membership in the Vatican II church, yet openly disregard its hierarchy. That is, they recognize the modern hierarchy, but resist it. They claim that the Pope is teaching error, and therefore they must sift his teachings and decide for themselves which of his directives they will obey and which ones they will disregard. They insist that the new Mass is valid, but yet it is a danger to your faith. Therefore, they have set up an independent hierarchy that ordains priests and bishops and operates independent Mass centers that compete with the Novus Ordo for attendance. But with a system of recognize and resist, one can never be sure of their faith. For if Catholics cannot be sure that what the Pope teaches is free from error, what guarantee is there that the Pope checkers are free from error? Who is there to sift the Pope checker? And when there is disagreement among the Pope checkers, they must form a new resistance, that is, a resistance to the resistance. But to suggest that the Pope could be a danger to your faith, and therefore you need to set up an independent hierarchy to sift his teachings, is neither traditional nor is it Catholic. However, there is a persistent remnant of Catholics who refuse to compromise the Catholic teaching on the papacy, nor will they settle for just a Latin Mass side chapel. These traditional Catholics will not settle for anything less than the Catholic faith in its entirety. These faithful Catholics are called Seed Vacantes. Seed Vacante is just a Latin phrase that means the chair is vacant. It is a term used to describe the vacancy of the papal office that occurs between the death of one pope and the election of his successor. It is a name given to traditional Catholics who have adopted the theological position that the chair of Peter is currently vacant. They maintain that all the men who have claimed to occupy the papal office since the Second Vatican Council have publicly defected from the Catholic faith, and therefore, regardless of election, they are simply not eligible to hold the papal office. To some, this position may seem a little confusing. They wonder how anyone can say that the office of the papacy is currently vacant when they can look to Rome and see that there is a man who is recognized by most of the world as Pope. But it is important to understand that death is not the only way in which the papal office can become vacant. A vacancy of the Holy See can also occur by insanity, resignation, or public defection from the Catholic faith. And it must be made perfectly clear that seed vacantism in no way challenges the authority of the papal office or the obligation of all Catholics to submit to the Roman pontiff. It is a position that challenges the validity of particular claimants to the office, not the authority of the office itself. Now, the idea that a non-Catholic is not eligible to be Pope is not just the conjecture of some traditional Catholics. It is a well-established principle that is rooted in divine law. And before Vatican II, this was considered a non-controversial teaching that was taught by popes, saints, doctors of the church and theologians, and decreed in canon law. And this is not just an obscure theory held by some theologians. It is a rather straightforward principle that was openly taught before Vatican II. Consider the 1910 Catholic Encyclopedia article on heresy. The Catholic Encyclopedia states, quote, The Pope himself, if notoriously guilty of heresy, would cease to be Pope because he would cease to be a member of the Church. And it only stands to reason that a man who does not hold the Catholic faith cannot be head of the Catholic Church, as Pope Leo XIII tells us in his encyclical, Santis Cognitum, quote, It is absurd to imagine that he who is outside can command in the Church, and this results necessarily from the nature of the Church, for if the members of the Church could hold a different faith than their head, how could it be said that the Church is one in faith? 
Distinction must be made between a sacrament and an office. Consider that the sacrament of holy orders imprints an indelible mark on the soul of the recipient, and therefore, even if a priest should lose his faith and become an atheist, he cannot stop being a priest. The sacramental mark of the priesthood will remain on his soul for all eternity. However, the office or jurisdiction of a priest or bishop is not part of the sacrament of holy orders, and therefore the office does not leave an indelible mark. Even though a priest will always remain a priest, if he should publicly defect from the Catholic faith, he would by that fact lose any office that he may have held within the church. It is important to understand that the papacy is an office, not a sacrament. The loss of office for public defection from the faith is a very straightforward principle that is clearly taught in the 1917 Code of Canon Law. Canon 188 states, quote, All offices shall be vacant ipso facto, that is, without declaration required, by tacit resignation, Number four of this same canon tells us that such a resignation is affected by, quote, public defection from the Catholic faith. Remember that the 1917 Code of Canon Law was not making new law. It was organizing and summarizing the Church's existing law. The footnote for Canon 188 cites the papal bull Cum Ex Apostolatos by Pope Paul IV as the source of this law. Paul IV, Papal Bull Cum Ex Apostolatos Officio. Quote, if ever at any time it shall appear that any bishop, even if he be acting as an archbishop, patriarch or primate, or any cardinal of the aforesaid Roman church, or, as has already been mentioned, any legate or even the Roman pontiff, prior to his promotion or his elevation as cardinal or Roman pontiff, has deviated from the Catholic faith or fallen into some heresy, the promotion or elevation even if it shall have been uncontested and by the unanimous assent of all the cardinals, shall be null, void, and worthless. Since the papacy is an office, it follows that, if the man occupying that office should publicly defect from the Catholic faith, he would ipso facto, that is by that fact, lose his claim to the papal office. But how are we to know if someone has defected from the Catholic faith? No one can know the internal dispositions of another. However, heretics are not judged by their internal disposition, but rather on their public defection from the faith. Ludwig Ott, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, quote, Public heretics, even those who err in good faith, do not belong to the body of the church, that is, to the legal commonwealth of the church. The church is a visible society whose members must be identifiable, Catholics are identified by their public profession of the same faith, and therefore, regardless of internal disposition, all those who publicly defect from the faith are by necessity excluded from the church. For how could the church claim to be one in faith if its members could publicly hold different faiths? Now Francis has not only publicly denied some of the most fundamental Catholic doctrines, he has also publicly participated in idolatrous rituals, and it is not just a few traditional Catholics who have noticed the heresies of Francis. Indeed, he has deviated so far from the Catholic faith that even some of his supporters have accused him of heresy. More than 60 Roman Catholic theologians, priests, and academics have accused Pope Francis of spreading heresy. The group sent a letter of filial correction to the Pope and outlined seven heresies they believe he has spread. What are good Catholics to make of the fact that the man who claims to be head of the Catholic Church does not actually profess the Catholic faith? To be a good Catholic, one must reject heresy. Therefore, when Catholics see the man who claims to be Pope openly teaching heresy, they cannot follow him. But to be a good Catholic, one must also submit to the Pope. This is the seeming contradiction that has caused so much division in the traditional movement. To deny the papacy is schismatic, and yet to follow a non-Catholic heretic would make one a heretic as well. But there need be no difficulty in reconciling Francis or any of the other post-conciliar popes with the papacy. While the office of the papacy is of divine faith, the identity of the man who would hold that office is not. In other words, God revealed the office of the papacy, not the names of the men who would hold that office. This does not mean that accepting the outcome of a papal election is optional. 
the identity of the Pope, while not a doctrine of divine faith, is still a dogmatic fact. Once a man has been lawfully elected Pope, he must be accepted as Supreme Pontiff by the Universal Church. But what if a man were elected who is not eligible to be Pope? Consider as an analogy the office of the President of the United States. The Constitution not only lays out how a president is elected, but it also lists three qualifications. To be elected president, you must be at least 35 years old, be a natural-born citizen, and you must be a U.S. resident for at least 14 years. But what if a man were elected president who was not 35 years old, or a natural-born citizen? It does not matter how popular such a person is, or how many votes they get. According to the Constitution, they are not eligible to be president. Such a person must be rejected, and rejecting them would not mean that you rejected the office of the presidency. On the contrary, it would actually show a lack of respect for the office to accept someone as president who is not eligible to hold the office. Now consider the office of the papacy. To be elected pope, there are three requirements. First, you must be baptized. Second, you must be a man, and third, you must profess the Catholic faith. But what if a woman or a non-Catholic were to be elected? They are not eligible to hold the office of the papacy, and therefore they must be rejected. And by rejecting them, it would not mean that you rejected the dogma of the papacy. On the contrary, to uphold the dogma of the papacy requires that you reject unqualified claimants. There are those who accept the principle that a non-Catholic cannot be Pope, but still object to the Seed Vacantis thesis, arguing that it is not permitted to accuse the Pope of heresy, because, even if the Pope is a heretic, no one has the right to judge him. And this is true. No one does have the right to judge the Pope. However, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, this argument assumes that these men are indeed true Popes. And second, if heresy is manifest, that is, evident to all, Catholics are not only permitted, they are required to make a judgment. Consider that every time a Catholic gives his assent to the teaching of the Church, he is making a judgment. And if Catholics are able to determine what the Church teaches and assent to it, it follows that they are also able to judge if something is contrary to Church teaching and reject it. Therefore, when Catholics see Francis and the other post-conciliar popes, openly teaching contrary to previously defined Catholic dogmas, they not only can, but they are required to make a judgment. And the list of things that Francis has taught that directly contradict previously defined Catholic dogmas is actually rather staggering. He has denied the existence of hell. He claims that Jews can be saved without accepting Jesus. He has taught that the Ten Commandments are not absolutes. He teaches that non-Catholics should not convert to the Catholic faith, and he even teaches that atheists can be saved. The list of heresies that Francis has taught is so overwhelming that it might be more effective to focus on just one. Consider the joint declaration on human brotherhood that Francis signed with the Grand Imam at an interfaith meeting in Abu Dhabi. This joint declaration states in part, quote, the pluralism and diversity of religions color, sex, race, and language are willed by God in his wisdom. Pope Francis issued a controversial statement on religious pluralism. Francis says diversity of world religions is willed by God, which appears to contradict 2,000 years of church teaching, leading some to suggest he's engaging in heresy. Remember that the scriptures tell us that the gods of the heathens are devils. To say that God wills the diversity of religions is actually worse than just heresy. It is apostasy. It is to completely abandon the religion revealed by God by putting it on the same level with false religions. This joint declaration was signed by Francis and published in the Acts of the Apostolic See. What is published in the Acts of the Apostolic See may not be dogma, but it is the official teaching of the Church. If Francis were actually a true pope, all Catholics would be required, under pain of mortal sin, to give this teaching their interior religious assent. And yet, many of those who criticize Seed Vacantis for, quote, judging the Pope, see no contradiction when they withhold their assent from his teaching. 
withholding your assent from the Pope's official teaching, is to judge the Pope. Why would you resist the Pope unless you have judged him guilty of something that must be resisted? It is mortally sinful to withhold your assent from the Pope's official teaching, but to accept Francis as your Pope and assent to this declaration is not just heresy, it is apostasy. To accept Francis as your Pope but resist this declaration is to deny the unity of the Church, for if Francis is your Pope, you must be one in faith with him. The Catholic Church has four marks by which she may be identified, that is, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. The Church is one because all her members profess the same faith. Therefore, a Church whose members are not one in faith is by definition not the Catholic Church. The only way to reconcile the teachings coming from the post-conciliar popes with the Catholic faith is to conclude that these men are not true popes, that is, they are in fact anti-popes, and the church they lead is a counterfeit Catholic church. When one examines the evidence, they will find that seed vacantism is the only conclusion that is compatible with Catholic doctrine. However, to say that the office of pope is currently vacant is a difficult thing for many to accept. But to avoid admitting that the chair is currently vacant, one must either deny that the post-conciliar popes have said and done the things that they have said and done, or one must deny some part of Catholic teaching on the papacy. Much of the confusion that exists among traditional Catholics today is the result of accepting the false and harmful idea that a non-Catholic can be pope. To accept a non-Catholic as pope destroys the unity of the church it destroys the authority of the papacy, and it actually makes the papacy a danger to your faith. Seed vacantism may not have all the answers. However, it is the only solution that does not involve contradiction. Nevertheless, some will go to great lengths to avoid this conclusion. Many would rather have a pope with contradictions than an empty chair. Seed vacantis are just Catholics who refuse to change their religion by accepting the new counterfeit church founded at Vatican II. They want nothing more than to practice the faith handed down from the apostles. In other words, they just want to be Catholic. For more information on seed vacantism, contact cmri.org or novusordowatch.org.